Hello everybody and welcome to the third lecture of 6838. Today we're going to jump right into the theory and practice of differential geometry and go about the one dimensional case. That is, we're going to talk about how to define and work with curves which are locally one dimensional objects. Now there's a lot of reasons to start with curves in a geometry class. I think almost any geometry class you take, certainly on the theoretical side, is going to do that. Um, for one thing, the math is a little bit easier, but it still gives you some flavor of what we like to do in differential geometry. Um, and beyond that, actually what we're going to find is that we can do some calculations on curves and then directly borrow them in high dimensional cases without changing anything at all, or even reducing it to the curve case and then reusing something that we've already defined. That's certainly how we're going to go about defining objects like curvature in the next couple lectures when we get to surfaces. So for now, of course, the first thing that we have to do in a lecture on curves is essentially to understand what our enemy is. So we have to define what a curve is. Now, initially this doesn't sound so hard. I mean, you've all probably worked with curves since high school. Um, usually we think of curves as like a function f of t, where t is a one-dimensional variable. We think of it like time, and then f of t is some position in 2D or 3D. And that's a reasonable definition to work with from a calculus perspective, but we're going to see the functions f of t don't necessarily trace out objects that look one-dimensional. In fact, they could be zero-dimensional or they could have non-differentiable features, which in differential geometry universe is against the rules. Okay, so what we have to do is understand that a curve is not a function. I'm going to say that a lot today, but rather a curve is a geometric object. And let's see if we can go about that in a little bit more detail. So if you remember from calculus class, probably the way that you went about defining a curve as a geometric object was quite simple. It was just some function gamma of t, right? So t is some point on the real line. That's like the blue curve downstairs. And then gamma of t is some point, for example, in R2, which is the plane, or R3, which is 3D. So the analogy is, you know, the car is driving along, t is time, gamma of t is the position of the car, and so as the car drives, it traces out a curve in two or three dimensions. And that's a reasonable definition, and indeed we're going to get pretty close to working with it in this course, but if we want to be totally pedantic about it, I would argue that this definition doesn't actually work all that well. And in order to sort of see that point, let me give you the world's least interesting counterexample. It looks something like this. Gamma of t is identically equal to 0, 0, the origin. I think most of us would agree that the thing that this car is tracing out is not a curve. It's just one point in the plane. And so it's not enough to just say a curve is a function gamma of t and, you know, clean our hands of the situation and move on. Rather, we have to be a little bit more careful to capture some of the subtleties. Now you might say, fine, so a curve is not gamma of t, you know, maybe it's gamma of t with the condition that gamma prime is not equal to zero or something like that. And you're starting to get there, but let me give you another counter example that you should continue to think about. That looks something like this schematic here. So here I'm giving you two different curves, gamma one of t, gamma two of t, at least two different functions, that much is for sure. So gamma 1 of t is very clearly just tracing out the curve y equals 2 times x. I think we can all see that. Now this crazy curve gamma 2 of t, it feels like something kind of funny might be happening, right? So when t is less than 1, uh, gamma 2 of t and gamma 1 of t agree with one another. They're both tracing out the same thing, t comma 2t. But then at, uh, at t equals 1, something crazy happens. In particular, if you kind of stare at this function for a little while, what you'll figure out is that if we think of our analogy of a car driving along our curve, then at t equals 1, the driver jams on the accelerator, the car doubles in speed, but it keeps driving in the same direction. Now, are gamma 1 and gamma 2 the same function? No, they're absolutely not the same function of t, right? I can put in the same t values when t is bigger than 1, and I'll get two different points, depending on whether I evaluated gamma 1 or gamma 2. But are they the same curve? I would argue yes. Both of these curves actually are just tracing out the locus of points where y is equal to 2 times x. So now we have two counterexamples. One is really simple. It's just gamma of t is identically 0, 0. This object is a curve. 
The other is that we have two distinct functions that both trace out the same curve in the plane. Finally, in today's lecture, we're going to be developing theory that's specific to the universe of differential geometry. And of course, what that means is that we don't just care about curves, we actually care about smooth curves. And then things become even more subtle. So for example, here is yet another counterexample just to kind of get you thinking for today's lecture. Uh, and that's the function gamma of t is equal to t squared comma t cubed. Now, as a function of t, gamma of t on the slide here is differentiable, infinitely differentiable, right? Uh, and so it might make you think that the curve that it traces out is a smooth curve. But if I punch in a bunch of values of t and plot the resulting points, then I get the graph that you see on the slide here. And notice that it has a really crazy feature right in the middle. It has a feature that we call a cusp. Now, the feature geometrically is a sharp point. I think we would all argue that we can't really think about derivatives of our curve at that cusp. But yet, the function gamma of t is differentiable. This initially feels like some kind of contradiction. And if we investigate further, we can work out exactly what's going wrong. Specifically, if we think of t like time and gamma of t like the position of a car driving at time t, then at time t equals 0, the car comes to a stop just for an infinitesimal tiny amount of time, turns the steering wheel a bunch, and then keeps driving off in some other direction. So the people in the car don't experience some crazy amount of force on them because the car came to a gentle stop and then just continued off in another direction. Right? That's why the function is smooth. But the car did have a sudden change of direction between the positive and negative t values. So when we put all of our observations together, the high-level conclusion that we can draw is that using functions gamma of t as a proxy for defining a curve is actually kind of a tricky matter. It's not the case that there's some one-to-one -one map between the set of curves and the set of functions gamma of t from the real numbers into R2 or R3. And I would argue that if we want to be pedantic and really understand the deep reason why this is the case, what we should do is remember that geometric objects are not functions, they're sets of points. So a curve is not a function gamma of t, but rather it is a set of points in R2 or R3 or Rn, whatever, it's not going to matter, with some certain properties that make it look like a one-dimensional object. Curves are not functions, they're not differentiable functions, they're not necessarily functions with some equivalence relations, although we could probably make that work if we had to, it might be a little messy. So curves are sets of points, right? And just more generally speaking, geometric objects are sets of points. They're not just functions. Functions are just convenient ways to work with geometric objects. And that's essentially what we do in differential geometry. We try to first make our definitions that are purely geometric objects. And then when we want to apply the theory of calculus to understanding these objects, we start to introduce objects like functions to allow us to compute derivatives using machinery we've already established. OK, so our geometric definition of a curve is going to look something like this. A curve is a set of points that locally looks like a line. So what do we need to do? We need to define what it means to locally look like something. <laughs> and we need to define what it means to look like a line. <laughs> and then when we put all those pieces together, what we're going to get is a formal definition of what it means to be a curve. And thankfully, this is a well-trodden path in the theory of differential geometry. It's one that I think if you're a math major, you've taken math courses in the past, you're probably used to interpreting and thinking about. If you're a computer scientist and you're not used to this level of formalism, it might feel kind of unfamiliar and take a few tries to really understand deeply. So I'm going to explain it right now. And then what I'd encourage you to do on your free time is to really sit with this definition and draw schematics until you understand exactly what it's telling you about life. So here's our illustration of how we're going to go about defining what it means to be a curve. Remember that a curve is a set of points. So we're going to talk about defining a two-dimensional curve. And then the definition for an n dimension, a curve embedded in n dimensions is no harder. It's just we're going to replace 2 with n. But just for the fact that our PowerPoint slide here is two-dimensional, let's stick with 2D curves. <laughs> 
So we're going to think of a curve C as a subset of R2. This is fancy notation for saying that a curve is a set of points. And it has the following property. Namely, what we can do, here's our curve C. Well, we can draw a point P on our curve, for example, right here. And what we want to know is whether our curve looks one dimensional around this arbitrary point P. So how could we do that? Well, what we can say is that for every P on our curve, there's going to exist some little neighborhood around P, which let's call U, where our curve looks like the image of a line under a simple function. In particular, what we're going to say is that for every P, I can draw a little neighborhood U around P, and I'm going to write a function down, gamma of P, gamma sub P, rather, And gamma sub p is going to be a function of the real line. In fact, just some interval in the real line is good enough. OK? And so essentially, what we're going to say is that a curve is an object where around every point p, I can take some tiny little segment of our curve. And that tiny little segment is given by some map gamma sub p from the real line. Now, remember that we still have to discount this case where gamma is just like identically one point. So what do we do? We add one additional condition, which is that the gradient, or rather the derivative of gamma p can never go to zero, right? So in other words, the car always has to keep driving with some positive velocity. So again, to repeat, because I know this definition is a little tricky to parse, a curve is a set of points on the plane for a planar curve, or a set of points in Rn, more generally, such that for every point P on our curve, there exists some neighborhood U around P and a function gamma sub P that where the intersection of our curve and U is parametrized by gamma. Whew. Now, why do we need this neighborhood U? Well, one thing that you could imagine could happen would be, ah, I'm having some trouble here. Uh, that our curve maybe comes back like that. <laughs> and now technically our curve has two segments and I'd have to make my neighborhood U a little smaller. That wouldn't be any good. So here's our formal definition that's in the course notes. Uh, that it, and essentially it just plays out exactly the schematic that we just drew here. So a differentiable curve is nothing more than a set of points with the property that for every P there exists an open neighborhood U containing P and a smooth function gamma sub P so that the intersection of the curve and u, so like this little segment, uh, is parametrized by gamma. Gamma, unsurprisingly, is known as a local parameterization of our curve. So let's clean things up a little bit. Okay, so for curves specifically, we can make one definition that splits the difference between this kind of complicated one and what we'd really like to work with, which is just one differentiable function. And that leads us to a definition called a parametrized curve. And a parametrized curve is really given by just one function, gamma of t, that goes from t into our curve. And to make sure that it doesn't have a cusp or doesn't just grind to a halt and draw a point, we add the condition that gamma prime of t is never equal to zero for any value of t that's within our curve. Now, the one thing that parametrized curves allow us to do that the definition on the previous slide does not is it allows us to have curves that self-intersect, like the loop-de-loop -loop we see on the slide here. We're going to see that that doesn't really make a uh, critical difference in our theory. But one thing that you should do is go back to the previous slide with the definition of a curve rather than a parametrized curve and convince yourself why the picture that I've shown you on the slide here actually would not satisfy it at that crossing point of the curve in itself. So the previous definition is a tiny bit more, more strict. This one is a little bit easier to work with in, in, in calculus terms. We're mostly going to work with parametrized curves today, and you can convince yourself that basically all the calculations we do are relevant to curves that are not parametrized. In fact, one way to do that is you can show that every curve is a parametrized curve. So in other words, for any curve, satisfying the definition on the previous slide, there exists a function gamma of t that traces it out, at least locally. Well, at least locally by the definition, and in fact globally. Okay, so 
uh, a little bit of vocabulary word for parametrized curves. Since parametrized curves are given by functions, then we can talk about the trace of a parametrized curve, which is the set of points that are traced out by our function gamma. And you know, the function gamma of t goes from time t into x, y, and z simultaneously, or x and y simultaneously, if you're in the plane. Um, we can call the x, y, and z functions individually the component functions of our curve. Okay, so that kind of concludes our list of definitions. And now we're going to start doing some interesting stuff with cur uh, curves. First in the plane, and then in 3D. In the last 20 seconds of class, I'm going to give you the right search terms for the n-dimensional case, although n-dimensional curves really don't show up a whole lot in our treatment in this course. In fact, I'd love if you guys suggest some interesting applications. So now that we've made all of these basic definitions, we know what our basic enemy is, we know what a curve is and a parametrized curve is, we can start to do some interesting differential geometry. Now, the basic question that we want to answer when we do differential geometry is what measurements can we make using the tools from calculus applied to things like functions of gamma that really are geometric rather than telling us something about gamma specifically as some function. So when we talk about parametrized curves, the really key consideration here is that our geometric measurements need to be invariant to changes of parameter. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember our example from a few slides back, right? We had this car that was driving along y equals 2x, and it got to some point t equals 1, jammed on the accelerator, doubled the speed, but traced out the same curve. Well, if I define any measurement about my curve gamma in terms of the function gamma of t and its derivatives, if I now substitute in gamma of phi of t, you know, so in other words, I like double the speed of, of time by using some substitution in phi, then the measurement should actually remain the same. It should be associated with points on the curve rather than with my specific choice of a parameterization gamma. If that sentence didn't make sense, you really sit back and think about it. It's almost a philosophical statement. So in today's lecture, we're going to work with a pair of curves that might feel different but secretly are the same curve. <laughs> uh, and here's how we're going to do it. Well, uh, we're going to work with a curve uh, gamma of t. That's our good old parametrized curve. We're going to assume gamma prime is always non-zero so that our curve doesn't do anything too crazy. And we're going to work with a second curve, which we'll call gamma tilde. And gamma tilde is going to be a function of t tilde. Uh, and we're going to define it to be uh, that gamma tilde is equal to, really, uh, we're going to think of it as being a function of just gamma of some function phi of t tilde. So hopefully you guys agree that these two things trace out the same curve based under the condition that phi prime is greater than zero. So phi is just some increasing function um, and, and that it's essentially just some function from time to time that's rewarping the uh, time that the car is at but not its position in space. Okay, so we have two different things. We have gamma of uh, t, our first curve, then we have gamma tilde of t tilde, which we're going to define to be gamma of phi of t. Oftentimes we use um, some nice composition notation here. We can write gamma composed with phi of t tilde. So in other words, really, we're thinking of phi of t tilde as t. Yeah, that's all we did. We just made a quick substitution. All right. So any measurement that we make about our curve that should be about our curve as a set of points rather than as a function should be invariant to the change of variables that I just wrote on the slide here. Yeah, so in other words, if I match t and t tilde, then gamma tilde and gamma should give us the same measurement. If you're wondering, I had to record this three times before I got that story right. I, it's, it's an easy one to get all kinds of knotted up. We'll see if we keep it straight today. So. Let's first come up with an example of a measurement about a curve that does not satisfy the property that we have on the slide here, and that is computing velocity. So again, remember that we're going to think of gamma, there should be a tilde on that t, I apologize, this should be gamma of t tilde, uh, gamma tilde of t tilde, which is gamma of phi of t. You can see how I keep getting it wrong here. So uh, let's actually compute the velocity of this curve here. So if we do that, what are we going to get? 
again, remember there should be a T tilde in here. This uh, is not quite correct. I try and draw it. In fact, maybe I can, just for fun. There should be a tilde here. <laughs> and a second tilde here. All right. So let's differentiate in this parameter T tilde. What do we get? Well, we get gamma tilde prime of T tilde by the chain rule, that's nothing more than gamma prime of phi of t tilde scaled by phi prime of t tilde. Okay? But now there's going to be a problem, right? Because gamma and gamma prime are the same curve, right? They trace out the same locus of points in the plane. And yet, when we compute the velocity of gamma tilde and we compute the velocity of gamma, they don't give us the same vector. In fact, one of them is scaled by this factor phi prime that isn't in front of the other. So computing velocity is actually an example of a measurement that is not invariant to reparameterization, and hence, we cannot use it in differential geometric computation. Or rather, we can use it in, in our computation, but we can't use it as a geometric formula. It's just sort of a useful byproduct of, of some other math. So now, let's talk about a formula that is invariant to our choice of parameter. And that, unsurprisingly, is the length of a curve. So hopefully you remember from calculus that if you have a curve gamma of t, then you can compute its length using the formula that we see on the slide here. The length of a curve is nothing more than the integral of the first derivative of the curve after you take the norm of that derivative. And what we're going to see is that computing arc length is actually invariant to reparameterization. Now, of course, arc length has to be in some interval or a curve from time A to time B. So we need to be careful to align our time between the two curves. So here's how we're going to do it. Let's. Uh, there's our formula for arc length, now with two uh, floating tildes, <laughs> which we no longer need. Um, and let's uh, talk about how we're going to compute arc length being invariant to changes in parameter. So here's how we can show it. Let's start by computing the arc length of our curve gamma tilde. And we're going to need to be careful about the endpoints of our curve to make sure that they match up between the two. In particular, we're going to say that gamma goes uh, with some time range t from a to b, right? This is going to be for gamma. And then uh, gamma tilde goes from, uh, t, uh, from a tilde to b tilde. And we're going to relate the two by saying that a is equal to phi of a tilde, and b is equal to phi of b tilde, OK? This is just to make sure that like, if our time interval shifted in that function uh, phi, uh, that we account for that. Hopefully I did it right. I, I always get this wrong. In fact, I have multiple times today. OK, so let's compute the length of our curve gamma tilde. Well, based on the formula that we have in the upper corner here, we know that this is equal to the integral from a tilde to b tilde of the derivative of our curve. So this is gamma tilde prime of t tilde. Take the norm and integrate with respect to t tilde. Oof. OK, so now we can start to make our substitutions. Yeah, so remember that by definition, gamma tilde is just gamma composed with phi. And in particular, we have this formula uh, right here for the uh, derivative. Right? So what we can write is that this is really the integral from a tilde to b tilde of what? Well, it's the norm of this vector. This is a scalar, and this is a vector. So really, it looks like the following. Gamma prime of phi of t tilde times the absolute value, because it's inside of a norm, of phi prime of t tilde. Now, just for convenience, I'm going to make one additional assumption, which is I'm going to assume that phi prime is greater than 0. 
So in other words, we're not going to reverse time in our curve. Otherwise, we just have to keep track of a sign in this expression here. But I don't feel like doing that today. So we're just going to assume that essentially there's some function from time to alternate tilde time that's increasing. OK. So now we can apply our integral change of variables formula. In particular, we're going to write t as phi of t tilde. Right. So notice that dt is equal to phi prime of t tilde dt tilde. OK, so now when we carry out our integral change of variables applied to the expression that we have here, we're going to find that this is the integral from a to b of gamma prime of t to norm dt. And I'm thinking my lucky stars right now because this expression, if we look at our formula on the corner here, is exactly the length of our curve gamma. So let's step back 20 feet and kind of think about the calculation that we just did. <laughs> we have two curves which are identical up to reparameterization. In other words, we have gamma and gamma tilde, and the only difference between them is the time variable. Right? The, you know, the cars are both driving along the same path, but one car might be driving faster or slower than the other. We use the chain rule to derive this formula here, which is telling us basically how reparameterization affects the velocity of our curve. The first thing that that told us is that velocity is actually not a geometric measurement, right? Because we computed the velocity of these two curves, and they actually disagree thanks to this factor of phi prime. But when we compute arc length of the curves, a special thing happened, which is that we got the same value for both, right? We started with gamma tilde, and we plugged into the formula for arc length, did a little bit of calculus, and we ended up with the formula for the arc length of gamma rather than gamma tilde. What does that mean? Well, it almost feels like what we did was tautological, but it actually wasn't. What we showed is that this formula here gives us the same number for arc length even if we plug in a different curve gamma that's identical uh, to the original curve gamma, just up to reparameterization. And that's the point. This is like the kind of thing, if you take an intro differential geometry class that you'll just do over and over and over again, you'll have some parameterization of your function, like gamma, uh, of your, your geometric object, rather. And remember, the, the geometric object is a set of points. It's not a particular function gamma. So we have to be sure that if we chose a different function gamma that traced out the same object, we'd still get the same measurement. This is like a philosophical thing that happens all the time in the theory of differential geometry. So what do we do? We define something in terms of derivatives, but then we go back and check that secretly that formula really didn't depend on our specific choice of gamma. Any gamma that traced out the same curve would give us the same length, and hence length is really a geometric measurement. Okay, so let's clear things out. Okay, all clear. So we now have our first example of a measurement, arc length, that is invariant to reparameterization of a curve. In fact, sometimes a useful thing here is because there's so many different functions, gamma of t, that all give us the same arc length, maybe we try to choose a canonical function, gamma of t, just to make our life a little bit easier. So we don't have to keep doing these same calculations to double check that all of our measurements are invariant to reparameterization. So one of the simple things that we often check is Rather than working with curves that are just generically parametrized any way that we want, instead we're going to work with curves that are specifically parametrized by arc length. By the way, there's a great abbreviation for this. Sometimes, uh, like my, my favorite math textbooks call this PBAL for short, parametrization by arc length, or parameterized by arc length. So what do we do? We're going to define, given just some generic parametrized curve gamma of t, a function s of t given the slide. And essentially, s of t is the arc length of our curve starting from some arbitrary t naught to the current value t. Now, one thing that we can check is, is that s of t is an increasing function. And in particular, that means that it's invertible. So we're going to define a second function phi, which is the inverse of the function s. 
Now, this sounds complicated, but it's not. Essentially, what it's saying is that it goes from arc length back to t. Yeah, so the function phi is answering the, the question of like, if I wanted to travel five feet along my curve, what t value should I use to get there, right? That's the inverse of arc length. Then we're gonna use a special reparameterization, which is gamma tilde of s. By the way, the convention in differential geometry is almost always to use the variable s, where essentially we can write that this is gamma of phi of s. So remember that phi goes from arc length to t, and then t goes into gamma. Now notice on the slide, I've written the phrase constant speed parameterization. Let's really check that that's the, the, uh, the case here. So in particular, uh, let's take the derivative uh, gamma tilde prime of s here and see what we get. So uh, if we write gamma tilde prime of s, well, remember that gamma tilde is gamma composed with phi, right? So again, by the chain rule, that's what? That is gamma prime of phi of s times phi prime of s. Hopefully that makes enough sense. But what is phi prime? Well, by the inverse function theorem, remember that phi and s are inverses of each other. So this is really the same thing as 1 over s prime of t, where the t is chosen to match here. So, well, okay, in that case, what we end up getting, well, what is s prime? Well, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, right, if s is the integral of gamma prime, then s prime is just the thing inside of the integral. So this expression is really gamma prime of phi of s just divided by the norm gamma prime phi of s. Notice that this is a unit vector. And so that's why we talk about our curve being parameterized by arc length as being a constant speed parameterization, right? Gamma prime here was the speed of our constant speed parameterization. And if we just work through the calculation, what we get is a vector divided by its norm. So necessarily, this is of unit length. OK. So why do we do that? Well, essentially, this constant speed parameterization is one specific choice of parameterization of our curve that only depends on the geometry, right? It only depends on arc length. And so if we construct a function out of gamma tilde and its derivatives in S, then that's already a geometric measurement. I don't need to go back and check that it's invariant to parameterization, essentially because I chose a parameterization, and the choice that I made only came from the geometry. So this allows us to do calculations a little more efficiently than we could do before. Now, we're gonna do a little bit additional work because what we're really after is a theory that describes the geometry of a curve. And so far, all I've managed to do is describe how to compute the length. But obviously, there are a lot of curves of the same length that are quite ge different geometrically. So now, we're gonna start working with gamma tilde and also its derivatives. Okay, so let's do that. So, in particular, what do we know? We know that gamma tilde here is a, uh, gamma tilde prime rather, is a unit vector. And let's specifically work with plane curves. Then, well, what do we know? We know that we can write the following, which is gamma tilde prime of s. Incidentally, we're gonna give this a definition. We're gonna call this big T of s. Big T stands for tangent. <laughs> Uh, well, because it's a unit vector in the plane, we know that there exists some angle theta uh, so that I can write that this is really cosine theta of s times the first standard basis vector E1 plus sine theta of s times E2. Remember that E1 and E2 are just like the x and y vectors. And the reason that I can do that is that any unit vector can be written as cosine and sine of some angle theta. Okay, so we've computed the first derivative of our curve. What happens when we compute the second derivative? Let's do that. In particular, we're gonna compute gamma tilde double prime <laughs> or t prime of s. All right, so what happens when we do that? Well, what we get 
for t prime of s, by the chain rule, we're going to get a theta prime, and then we're going to have to differentiate cosine and sine, right? So we'll get theta prime of s, that's a scalar, multiplied by the stuff that's differentiated in the inside. So the derivative of cosine is minus sine theta of s times e1 plus cosine theta of s times e2. All right. So let's see if we can simplify this expression a tiny bit. So notice that the x component of t is cosine and the y component is sine. Here, the x component is minus sine and the y component is cosine. Um, so we can write a really slick expression here and say that this is equal to theta prime of s times actually a rotation of the vector t. In particular, I can write a matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0 times t. Let's think about what that's going to do. It's going to take the y component of t and put it into the x component of its output, scaled by minus 1. So it's going to take that sign and make it into a minus sign. It's going to take the x component and put it into the y component, right? So that's, that's 1 down here. So it's just slick notation. So let's give these different objects names. We're going to call theta prime kappa of s. We're going to call this matrix here j. And we're going to call it the matrix vector product j times t n. OK? Um, notice that n, of course, depends on s. So these are the variable names. And here's how we read them. t is the tangent to our curve. n is the normal to our curve. j is a matrix that rotates 90 degrees. And kappa is a function called curvature. So let's see if we can draw a quick schematic of what's going on here. So here's our curve. And let's say that we're at some point. So this is like gamma tilde of s. Though remember that t is the first derivative. So it is some vector like that, t. And uh, it's a unit vector pointing parallel to the curve. Notice that this is invariant to parameterization in the sense that if I drove two times as fast along this curve, then I would still get a unit vector in the same direction when I computed this thing, because by definition, it's unit length. I, uh, even if I drive faster, it's not velocity. It's just the unit vector parallel to velocity. And then what we find is that n, well, it's orthogonal to t. It's supposed to be a 90 degree angle, so it looks something like that. Now, n is a unit vector that's orthogonal to t, right? See, you can tell that it's a unit because it just took t and rotated it 90 degrees. Uh, and then it's scaled by this value right here, kappa, which is I'm going to call curvature. Now, curvature is a very suggestive name, right? Curvature suggests that kappa has something to do with the bendiness of my curve. And indeed, that is absolutely the case. Now, how can I see that? Well, one thing to do is to remember that t uh, is the tangent to my curve, but it also is cosine of theta sine of theta, right? So if I think of theta as like some angle, you know, like I just draw the horizontal line and then theta is like that, right? Then theta is basically describing what direction my car is pointing as I drive along my curve in the, uh, in the plane here, right? This is all in R2. So then curvature is theta prime. It is the rate of change of the angle, like the bearing of my car as I drive along the curve with unit speed. Now, why is that curvature? Well, it's some measure of the bendiness of my curve, right? Like a curve that's somehow very curvy is one where I have to bend the steering wheel a bunch so that I'm like driving, you know, donuts along my curve. Whereas when curvature is zero, what is that telling me? That's telling me that theta is constant and actually my car is driving along a straight line. Pretty cool, huh? So that's our basic construction here. T is the unit tangent to our curve. N is the unit normal vector to our curve. Kappa is curvature, and I can think of it as the rate of change of the angle in which my car is pointing in the plane. So here's a, a nicer picture of what that looks like in this two-dimensional uh, kind of picture here. Uh, and, and that's really what's going on.
Okay, so, so far we have a pretty nice picture, but when we talk about differential geometry, so far I've told you that we don't want to talk about functions, we want to talk about geometric objects. That's absolutely the case. But if I want to be super picky, I might say if I take this entire curve and I just kind of rigidly like translate it somewhere else, it's more or less the same curve. In particular, like if I rotated a curve 90 degrees, sure it's tangent vector and it's normal vector are changed, but I kind of hope that the curvature would remain the same. Indeed it will. And so curvature is really the uh, measurement that I want to make that's somewhat invariant to all of the different things I could do to my curve that are not interesting from a geometric perspective. And so the higher level philosophical point here is that differential geometry kind of should be coordinate invariant. So when we do mathematical proofs and we refer to x and y components, it's mostly just a convenience rather than something that is really a purely geometric measurement. You know, if you go all the way back to your high school geometry class where you're just working with a compass and a straight edge, that's certainly the case. So the question then is how can I describe a curve without any coordinates at all? Well, this seems really hard to do. <laughs> um, in particular, I kind of made a choice of x and y coordinates in order to talk about like the different components of the tangent vector or even really to define this function gamma prime or gamma tilde to begin with. So how could I describe a curve without any coordinates? Well, I have to choose a coordinate system that is based on the curve itself. And so a really sneaky thing that was proposed by a mathematician named Fernet was to say, well, I can't really choose x and y coordinates here because those are depending on the plane that the curve is sitting on. It's, it's not really a set of coordinates that's specific to the curve itself. So Frenet proposed a really sneaky trick, which was to do the following, to say that basically if I'm sitting at some point p on my curve, the only coordinate system I have at my disposal is actually defined by the curve itself. This is sort of the turtles all the way down philosophy here, that the only cur uh, coordinates that are meaningful when I work with a curve are actually coordinates based on the curve itself. So rather than working with x and y, I can do my calculations in the basis of vectors t and n. Now in particular, one thing I might try and do is measure the rate of change of the tangent and the normal to my curve in this specific basis, which is pretty crazy. So in other words, I want to know how much the tangent vector and the normal vector are changing without reference to any outside coordinate system at all. It turns out that I can do that, and I'll get this formula on the top of the slide. So let's go ahead and derive it. So notice that the first formula on this slide here, right, the derivative of t is just equal to kappa times n, was what we uh, showed right here. Right? So this was the uh, first row. So now let's see if we can differentiate n and see what it looks like as a rate of change in t. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to glance at my notes really quick. So what do we get? Well, remember that n is just equal to j of uh, times t, right? So n of s is equal to j, which is a constant matrix, times t of s. So when we differentiate, we get n prime of s is equal to j times t prime of s. That's nothing too exciting so far. But what do we know? We know that t prime is equal to kappa times j times t, right? Or kappa times n. But let's do kappa times j times t. So this is equal to j times kappa of s times j times t of s. Okay. So kappa is a scalar. I can move kappa to the outside. One thing you can check about j is that j squared is equal to minus the identity. That's just a simple calculation you can do at home. So what I get at the end of the day is that this is equal to minus kappa of s t of s. OK, so what did I just show? I showed that if I can differentiate the tangent in arc length, then I get curvature times the normal. If I differentiate the normal in arc length, I get minus curvature times the tangent. And that is exactly what we're showing in this expression here. 
Okay, so hopefully that all checks out. This is an expression that's often known as the uh, Fernet formulas. And the Fernet frame is this canonical choice of coordinate system that only depends on the curve itself. And so it's really the pair t comma n, at least in two dimensions. Okay, so let's clear out and then continue uh, discussing things about curves. Okay, so, so far what we've done is we've derived two useful vectors at every point along a curve. Notice that it is a point on the curve, not something that depends on our parameterization, which is a good thing. The tangent and the normal. The tangent is just pointing in the direction that your, your car is pointing along the curve. The normal is pointing 90 degrees orthogonally to that direction where I'm driving. And I've also defined this interesting number called curvature, which is the rate of change of the direction in which my car is pointing. Incidentally, one more useful measurement that people often make about curves is something called the radius of curvature. This is just one over kappa, and very roughly you can think of it as like the radius of a circle that just barely touches your curve at a particular point. Incidentally, the circle that I'm showing you on the slide here has this uh, name, it's called the osculating circle of the curve. Uh, for those of you who know your what, Latin, Greek, whatever it is, Osculating means kissing, which I think is really cute. So the circle is just kissing along the uh, piece of geometry there. But these are all geometric measurements. They didn't depend on our particular choice of parameterization, which is the really nice thing. So why did we go to all this work? Well, we've now constructed what I would call a framed curve. Now, what does that mean? That means that there is a coordinate system associated to every point along the curve that I can compute from the curve itself. And moreover, I've actually sort of described how that coordinate system changes as I move along the curve, but I have to do it in kind of a sneaky way because the only coordinate system I have is the one that I just defined. So I talk about the rate of change of my coordinate system in the coordinate system I just wrote down, and that is that matrix system that was on the previous slide. So that seems like an awful lot of work, but at least we have some geometric measurements about our curve. In fact, one thing that we can show about a two-dimensional curve is that there's actually no other geometric measurements to be had. In particular, we can prove something called the fundamental theorem of the local theory of plane curves, which tells us that if I have just the curvature function, kappa of s, this actually distinguishes a planar curve up to rigid motion. So in other words, if I know the curvature of a curve, that's everything there is to know about a planar curve. There's nothing more. I can actually reconstruct the curve up to just translation and rotation in the plane, and maybe reflection, that's okay. Uh, notice this is one of these funny theorems where the statement is actually longer than the, uh, shorter than the name of the theorem itself. Okay, so uh, let's actually state this a little bit more carefully, and then I can sketch out the proof really quickly, and I think you guys can all fill in the blanks at home. So in particular, our proposition is going to look something like this. So we're going to say, given uh, a, a differentiable function kappa of s, we can say that, uh, and, and we're going to say that kappa of s goes from some interval a comma b into the real numbers, right? Because this is just some curvature function uh, 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 kappa, where here we're going to think of the number between a and b as like the point uh, s in arc length, then what we can say is that there exists a curve gamma of s with the property that uh, kappa is its signed curvature. Okay, so in other words, Every function kappa of s corresponds to at least one curve uh, gamma of s. There doesn't exist some weird function kappa of s that isn't the curvature of any curve. And in fact, uh, we can show a slightly uh, nicer statement, which is that if two curves have the same curvature function kappa of s, Well, then they're actually the same curve. So that is to say, more carefully, then uh, they are 
the same, except that I'm going to allow them to rotate, translate, and, ref and well, actually not reflect because our curvature in this case is uh, signed. So we're going to say up to uh, rotation and translation. So that's sort of just the more formal statement of the theorem that we've already written here on the screen. Okay, so there's really two different parts to this theorem. Right? The first part is that given any curvature function, I can construct a curve with that curvature. And then the second part is given two curves with the same curvature function, they're actually the same curve up to just kind of scooting around in the plane. Okay, so let's prove this really quick. We can essentially do number one carefully, and then I'll just sketch out number two. So, so let's do uh, part one first. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a value, S0, which is actually arbitrary, it doesn't matter, which is somewhere between A and B. And we're going to define a function theta of S which we can write uh, as follows. We're going to say that, that theta of s here is nothing more than the integral from s naught to s of kappa of s, ds. Okay, why did I do that? Well, remember that kappa, which is curvature, is the derivative of theta. So if I'm trying to recover my curve, then maybe one useful thing is to say, okay, I'm going to start with curvature, and I can integrate to get back to a angle function theta, right? So intuitively, when I reconstruct my curve from curvature, this theta here is going to be the heading of the car as it drives along the curve. Okay, so now, what can we do? Well, this is like the direction of the tangent, so we have to integrate one more time to actually recover the curve itself. So now we're gonna make a second definition, which is as follows. And we're going to define gamma of s to be a curve uh, where essentially this uh, theta here is the angle of its tangent. And the way that I can do that is by saying that the x component is the integral, again, from s0 to s of cosine theta of s ds times e1 plus the integral from s0 to s sine theta of s ds e2. Okay? So if you think about it, all I really did was just reverse engineer the uh, formulas that we had on the last couple of slides, which went from gamma to kappa. Now, like for every derivative that I computed in that direction, I'm computing an integral in this direction. So essentially, it is easy to check that gamma has curvature kappa, that's essentially just two applications of the fundamental theorem of calculus, so I'll let you do that at home. And uh, the point here is that gamma has curvature kappa, and hence the uh, first part of our, our theorem here is done. Right? There exists at least one curve gamma whose curvature is kappa. Okay. So now we need to prove the second part of our theorem, that if we have two curves with the same curvature, then really they're just the same curve up to rotation and translation. Okay? So let's uh, do that really quickly after we erase this bottom part here. Okay, that's all gone. So now let's just really quickly sketch out uh, part two of our theorem here. Um, and part two really follows from existence and uniqueness of solutions to differential equations. I encourage you to go back to Wikipedia and read about that if you've forgotten or if you haven't seen it before. So now we're going to take the second curve, which maybe we call, uh, you know, gamma tilde of s, that also has curvature s. Okay, so then both of our curves are going to satisfy the same uh, set of ordinary differential equations. Uh, in particular, they look something like this. So both curves satisfy the following um, ordinary differential equation, which I can write as 
d over ds. And just for fun, I'm going to not only compute the derivative of, of, of the curve, but also the tangent of the normal. So gamma tn is equal to, and now we've got 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, kappa, uh, 0 minus kappa 0 times, again, gamma tn. So they both satisfy all of these different relationships when it comes to differentiating them with respect to s. And if let's say that I take one curve and I just translate it and rotate it by just adding a constant and multiplying by a matrix. This is the part that I'm going to let you guys do at home and more formally. Essentially, if I translate and rotate my two curves, then one thing that I can figure out um, I can find a way to take gamma and gamma tilde, and up to translation and rotation, this ODE also has the same initial conditions. That is to say that essentially these derivatives at time zero uh, agree for the two curves. Well, it turns out that if we have two solutions to the same ODE, and that ODE has the same initial conditions for those two solutions, then under pretty weak assumptions, these two uh, functions are actually the same. And that is sufficient for us to finish our proof of the fundamental theorem of the local theory of plane curves, just like we need. OK, so that really concludes our discussion of two-dimensional curves. So let me uh, clear out our screen. And then we're going to talk about 3D a little bit. OK. So to summarize what we just did here, basically the idea was our, our proof is, is illustrated in this nice picture. So uh, here we think of the tangent to our curve, t of s, is really just cosine of theta and sine of theta, where theta is the direction that the curve points. And so there's actually, we can think of it as t, uh, t is kind of like a map from points on our curve into uh, points on the unit circle. And equivalently, so is n, just rotated 90 degrees. Uh, and then the curvature is the rate of change of this map theta. So this picture here, sometimes this is called the Gauss map, is a map from our curve into the circle. And it provides some intuition for what's going on with curvature. In particular, uh, the, the Gauss map is defined to be the map from every point in the curve to a point on S1, which is the unit circle, uh, which is giving the normal direction to the curve. Now, before we wrap up our discussion of 2D, we're going to make one more definition, which is going to be a useful structure that we're going to try and preserve when we talk about discrete curves in our next lecture. And that is a number called the winding number of a curve. And specifically, this is for closed curves. So a closed curve is one where gamma of A equals gamma of B, and the, the uh, tangents align at those two uh, points. So again, we're going to define a closed curve is one, oops, this marker is dripping all over the place, um, that satisfies two things. One is that uh, gamma of A equals gamma of B. So in other words, my curve has to close up. And the second condition is that gamma prime of A equals gamma prime of B. OK, so for closed curves, we can define this object called the winding number, which is what's shown on the screen. And the winding number is the integral of the curvature kappa from a to b divided by 2 pi. Now, if you think about it a little bit, kappa necessarily has to be an integer. Why is that? Well, remember that my curve closes up, and it has the same tangent. Um, at, at the beginning and the end, right? So I have some curve, you know, it's going all over the place, maybe it loops on itself a few times, but then it closes up, and when it closes up, the tangent vector is the same. Okay, so the tangent vector, remember if I think about that Gauss map, right, it's like spinning around the unit circle S1, and, you know, it starts out, let's see if I take this vector, well, actually, I guess, you know, and map it down here. It's not quite the Gauss map, it's the Gauss map up to 90 degrees then it's like spinning around the circle as I trace out this curve, that it ends up back where it started. What does that mean? Well, that means that cosine theta of A equals cosine theta 
of B. Similarly for sine. Which means that theta of A and theta of B are the same up to an additive, uh, an additive change of uh, a factor of 2 pi. Which means if we divide by 2 pi in this definition here, uh, then what we get is an integer for the winding number. The picture on the bottom shows us what is going on in the winding number, which is essentially, by the way, I mean, you can interpret this integral as theta of b minus theta of a, yeah? So the winding number is really measuring how many times a curve loops around itself before it gets back to the starting point. So because we define curvature in terms of that angle theta, the definition of the winding number is pretty intuitive. But later on, when we discretize curvature, one thing we could do is try to say, okay, maybe we can come up with a discretization of curvature that gives us an integral while we sum it around a closed curve. Uh, it gives us an integer, rather. And so one of the definitions that we'll propose next time actually satisfies that property. Okay, so we're gonna conclude our discussion today by considering the three-dimensional case of the Fresnay frame, which is a little bit more complicated. So let's clear things out and get started with that. Okay, so before we derive all the equations for curves in 3D, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a spoiler and show you what they look like, and then you can hold me honest as I try to derive them here on the board. Um, so now, when we talk about a moving frame, right, like this little 90 degree pair of vectors that moves along our curve, for a curve in 3D, we're gonna need three vectors. So now we're gonna have the tangent, right, that's like the direction that our car is driving, just like before. The normal, which is the rate of change of, or the, or the derivative of the tangent. And now we're gonna add a third vector to our moving frame along the uh, curve. We're gonna call it the binormal. And we'll use the letter B. So now we have T and N, just like we had in our previous proof, and B, which is going to account for that third dimension. And what's gonna happen when we talk about curves in 3D is that we're going to end up defining an object called curvature, kappa of S, which is gonna be identical to what it was in 2D. But in addition to that, we're gonna need a second measurement, which we're gonna call torsion, or tau of S, which is going to tell us about the rate of change of the normal vector. So intuitively, one way that we can think about curvature and torsion is explained on the slide here. So the curvature of a curve is kind of like the two-dimensional motion of the curve. Remember, going back to our intuition from earlier in the lecture, you know, we can think of curvature of a curve as like kind of what direction the steering wheel is pointed as we drive along the curve, right? It's the change, uh, the, the derivative of theta, like theta prime. Now, the torsion of our curve, whereas curvature is measuring in-plane motion, torsion is going to measure how non-planar our three-dimensional curve is. Like, can it come out of the page, or does it have to stay in some flat plane? And essentially, what we can show, we're not gonna derive it in this class, because we have limited time, is just the same as kappa determines the geometry of a curve on the plane. The pair of functions, kappa and tau, determine the geometry of a curve in 3D. We're not gonna give that result in this class. The proof isn't particularly hard, it's just kind of annoying to write down. But we are going to derive the formula that you see on the slide here, which is essentially giving you the derivative of the tangent, normal, and binormal, again, in the tangent, normal, binormal basis, right? This kind of circular reasoning almost. Okay, so let's get started with that. So I'm gonna take our formula here and move it to the corner, just to keep me honest at the end of the day. And to get started, we're gonna show a very short uh, little proposition here, which is essentially gonna give us some useful formulas to work with. I apologize, I keep glancing down at my notes because uh, I wanna make sure that I get it right on, I won't even say the first try, this is like the fifth try here. <laughs> okay, so here's gonna be our, our proposition here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take some vector function. So we're gonna say suppose that we have some function v of t, which goes from the interval from a to b into actually rn. This is gonna be good enough. And we're going to say that uh, the norm of V of t is identically equal to one. So it's just a bunch of unit vectors as a function of time. Then one thing that we can show is that V prime of t dot product with V of t is identically 
equal to zero. That's going to be the first part of our proposition. The second part is that if we have v of t and it's always orthogonal to another vector w of t, then we're going to have that um, v prime of t dot product with w of t is equal to minus v of t dot product w prime of t. Now, both of these uh, results are basically just very simple calculations from calculus, OK? So um, let's, let's call these part one and part two of our little proposition here. This is also stated in the course notes. And our proof is going to be pretty straightforward. So in particular, um, let's do uh, part one here. So this is the two norm. Of course, the squared two norm is nothing more than the dot product between v and itself. So I can say that v of t dot product with v of t is identically equal to 1, right? Because this is just the norm of v squared. So what does that imply? Well, let's differentiate both sides in t. What's the derivative of 1 with respect to t? This is 0. I'm going to flip sides while I'm at it, so this is going like that. <laughs> and what is the derivative of the left-hand side? Well, by the product rule, this is 2 v of t times v prime of t, which essentially gave us exactly the expression that we had. Okay? So these are easy little proofs. They're just kind of nice properties to keep in mind. So again, what is this telling us from a high level? It's saying if I have a vector which is always unit length and it's a function of time, then the derivative of my vector as a function of time is perpendicular, right? There's a dot product equal to zero to the vector itself. Okay, so now let's prove the second part of our proposition, which is basically equally easy. Okay, so remember that we have now uh, v prime dot w um, is the thing that we're after, but we started with v uh, dot w. So let's differentiate both sides of this expression. The derivative of zero with respect to zero is zero. <laughs> what is the derivative of v dot w? Well, it's v prime of t dot w of t plus v of t dot w prime of t, right? This is the product rule. Okay, so now if I just subtract this second term from both sides, right, then what do I get? I get v prime of t dot w of t equals minus v of t dot w prime of t, which verifies the second part of our proposition. So this is a really easy proposition, but it's actually, I don't know, it's like somehow weirdly profound to me. You know, if you have a unit vector and you differentiate it, then the rate of change is orthogonal to what you started with. And if you have two vectors that are like traveling along and they're orthogonal to one another as they move along, then they satisfy this kind of interesting uh, anti-symmetry property here. Okay, so this proposition is not particularly hard, but we're gonna use it a bunch of times. So I'm just gonna leave it up here as we continue our derivation of these Fresnel equations on the top of our slide here. But just so we have a little bit of room, I'm going to erase the proof, if that's OK. OK, so now that our proof of uh, this little proposition is gone, let's go about defining the tangent, normal, and binormal of a three-dimensional curve and showing that they satisfy the relationships up here when our curve is parametrized by arc length. So to get started, we're going to take a curve gamma of s, which we're going to say is parametrized by arc length, PBAL. And we're going to make one additional assumption on gamma, and we're going to return to it next time. We're going to assume that gamma double prime of s is not equal to 0. We're going to find that when gamma double prime is equal to 0, something a little bit uh, can go wrong. Not major, but a little, a little wrong. So, now we're going to make a new definition, which is identical to what we did in 2D, which is we're going to define t of s, which is just equal to gamma prime of s. Now, as we already showed earlier in today's lecture, um, since gamma is parameterized by arc length, we know that that implies that the norm 
of t of s is identically equal to 1. You'll see that our proof, even though it was part of the two-dimensional curves part of class, applies here with no change. As long as our curve is parametrized by arc length, uh, the norm of t is identically equal to 1. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, what that means by our proposition here, uh, so let's apply our, our proposition. What do we know? Well, we know that we can take the derivative of t, let's say t prime s, is equal to kappa of s times n of s, where uh, we can make a few more definitions here. We're going to essentially take kappa of s to be the norm of the second derivative of our curve. Now, essentially, because uh, kappa is defined to be the norm of the second derivative, then we also know that the norm of n is equal to 1. Now, by our proposition, if we take this uh, definition here and we apply our proposition to it, what we know is that n dot product with t is equal to 0. Why do we know that? Well, remember that t prime is the derivative of a unit vector, <laughs> right? So by our proposition, derivative of a unit vector, which is parallel to n, the derivative is parallel to n, so that means that the original thing is orthogonal to n, right? That's property number one here. So this is just property number one from our proposition. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've essentially derived the first row of our matrix, which just says that t prime is equal to kappa times n. When I say derive, we have to be careful about what's the definition here and what did we prove. Well, we kind of defined kappa times n to be t prime uh, by essentially taking kappa to be the norm of t prime and n to be the direction of t prime, but we double check that that is a uh, reasonable choice. And moreover, we show that n dot product with t is equal to zero as a byproduct of our proposition. Because in addition to these three expressions here, by the way, we're going to show that t, n, and b are mutually orthogonal unit vectors. Okay, so now we have two unit vectors. We have the tangent and we have the normal. We're going to make a third definition, which we're going to call the binormal. So we're going to define the binormal. I guess I didn't need to capitalize the b, but maybe I do. Um, because I'm going to write b is equal to the cross product of t and n. I'm dredging up all of the uh, vector algebra that you might have forgotten from a long time ago. Okay, so I had two orthogonal vectors t and n, and now I have a third orthogonal vector b, which is perpendicular to both t and n, just by definition. So, what do we know? We also know that b is unit length because t and n are unit length. So, in particular, we know that t, n, and b form an orthonormal basis for 3D, R3. Okay. So that's just because these are three mutually perpendicular unit vectors. Well, what do we know? We can take any vector in R3 and write it in a basis. That's certainly true. So in particular, we can say for any V in R3, we have the following relationship, which is that V is equal to V dot T times T plus v dot the normal vector times the normal vector plus v dot n, or v dot b, rather. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, times b. Because again, what is the picture we should have in mind here? Essentially, we have three mutually orthogonal vectors, t, n, and it's right-handed, b, a little confused whether this camera is going to flip left and right, but that's okay. Um, 
I think it might, so be a little bit careful with this picture. Uh, but in any event, we have three mutually orthogonal vectors, so if I want to take any other vector v, I can write it in the basis using this very simple formula. I think we all remember this from linear algebra class. Okay, so remember our goal here. Our goal is to derive these three formulas here. We, we now have made definitions of t, n, and b. We need to differentiate t, n, and b and make sure that we get the three relationships we've shown on the screen. We've already shown one of them, which is hiding right here, right? That t prime is equal to kappa times n. Now we're going to use this handy little formula here to prove everything else that we need. Okay, so maybe what we can do for fun is actually do this on the right-hand side of the uh, board, and then we'll erase it between n and b. Okay, so in particular, let's take v, which can be any vector in 3D, and specifically, we're going to choose v to equal n prime. So in particular, when v is equal to the derivative of n in s, then what do we get? Well, we get the following. We have n prime is equal to, now we've got to copy this formula here. So this is n prime dot t times t plus n prime dot uh, n times n plus n prime dot b times b. Okay. So can we get rid of any expressions in this formula that I just wrote down? Well, what are we going to do? We have this one useful proposition hiding on the corner of our screen here. And remember that n is a unit vector always as a function of time. So what does our proposition part one tell us? It tells us that n prime is perpendicular to n. So this dot product here is 0 by the proposition. See, I told you, we're going to use this proposition over and over and over again. Whew. OK, so now we have a, a few different expressions. And we're actually going to apply our proposition a second time. And we're going to say, OK, n and t are unit vectors. And we have n prime dot t, where n and t are perpendicular to one another. So this expression is the same thing as minus n dot t prime. Whew. OK, so why did I do that? Well, take a look. We know that t prime is kappa times the normal, right? So t prime is kappa times n. n dot n is just 1. So this is equal to minus kappa times the normal vector n plus 0 plus, and now we have this new quantity n prime dot b, which we haven't seen yet. So we're just going to give it a name. We're going to call this tau. This is the torsion. So this is going to be plus tau times b. And if you take a look, that is exactly the second row of our matrix here. So we've done two out of the three expressions. Sorry, I'm kind of standing behind the text here. I'm running out of space on our screen. <laughs> so finally, let's conclude by computing b prime. <laughs> and I'm going to end up writing all over myself. But thankfully, I'm, writing, I'm wearing black today. So maybe I'll keep my face in this little square here. <laughs> OK, so in order to do that, we're going to apply exactly the same trick again. I say, OK, so what is b prime? Well, by our formula here, b prime is equal to b prime dot product with t times t plus b prime dot product with n times n plus b prime dot product with b times b. Remember that b is a unit vector, so b prime dot product with b by our proposition part one is again going to zero. Oops. Okay, so now we're left with these two terms. But we don't know how to differentiate b, so it might make sense to take that prime and put it on the other side. So let's apply our proposition again. Remember that because these are unit vectors, we can move the prime to the other term in the product and incur a minus sign when we do that. Okay, so what do we get? We get that this 
is really equal to minus b dot t prime times t minus b dot n prime times n. Okay, but now we're cooking with gas because we know that we have expressions for t prime and n prime because we already showed the first two rows of our matrix here. So what is this? This is minus, we have b dot product with t prime, but t prime is kappa times n times t minus, and now we have uh, b dot n prime. Let's see, oops, if, uh, if I can squeeze this into the space that I have remaining. So n prime is minus kappa times t, oops, that should be minus, <laughs> getting tired, minus kappa times t, and then we have plus tau times b. All of that is now multiplied by n. Okay, Whew. almost done. Now in particular, Remember that kappa is just a scalar, so I can move it on the outside and have b dot n, but t, n, and b are all orthogonal to one another, so this term is zero. Similarly, I have b dot t here, so I'm going to get that the first term in this dot product is zero. I have b dot b, but b is a unit vector, so b dot b is one, and that just leaves me tau minus 1 and n. So this is minus tau times n, which is exactly the last row of our matrix here. Okay, so what did we prove? I'll peek into this little hole here. <laughs> Essentially, what we did is kind of a combination of definition and proof at the same time, which is like terrible sloppy mathematics, but you know, I'm a terribly little sloppy uh, instructor, so that worked out okay. Um, and essentially, we started with a curve, and we did make an assumption that gamma double prime is equal to uh, anything other than zero. And that's what allowed us to do this little expression here. So we took a curve that was parametrized by arc length, and we defined t to be its first derivative, so we know that this is unit length. When we differentiate t, which is like gamma double prime, well, by our proposition, we know that's orthogonal to t, so we call the direction of the second derivative the normal. That was just the same as we did on the plane. Then we said, well, we're in 3D, we have a t and an n, so if we want a third vector, we'll just take their cross product and get b, and that gave us an orthonormal basis. And now, to derive this little system of differential equations, the way that we did it was by using this nice little expansion formula we justified, and just plugging in n prime and b prime and the identities that we already derived. So this is a nice little proof. And what is it telling us geometrically? Well, essentially, we have this little triplet of vectors, right? We have the tangent, which is pointing parallel to the curve, the normal, which is orthogonal, and the binormal, which is mutually orthogonal. Those are sliding along the curve. And this is telling us how we're going to sense the rate of change of those three vectors in that vector basis, right? So it's kind of like if I'm a passenger in the car driving along this curve, and the car is driving with unit speed, and I close my eyes, this is telling us something about the forces that I'm feeling and, and the higher order derivatives as well. Okay, so let's clear this out and then conclude our discussion really quick. Okay, so again, those are the Frenet formulas now for curves in three dimensions. One thing that we'll conclude is just by stating the fundamental theorem of the local theory of space curves, which is just the three-dimensional analog of the 2D theorem we talked about before which is that if I know the curvature and torsion of a curve, I distinguish that curve up to rigid motion. We're not gonna prove that in lecture. The proof really isn't very difficult. It's very similar to what we did in two dimensions, although now we don't have access to that theta anymore, which made our 2D proof a little easier. Um, but the essential point here is that curvature in 2D and then curvature and torsion together in 3D completely describe a curve up to rigid motion, which is kind of an uninteresting geometric uh, uh, transformation. And so somehow these are the really nice intrinsic geometric measurements that you can make about a curve. 
And we managed to make them using the machinery of calculus and then going back and justifying that when we did that, it was independent of our parameterization. So it really was about that set of points that define the curve rather than our particular choice of functions gamma of t to drive along at. Now every year I get the same question, so I'll go ahead and address. Indeed, there does exist a sort of more generic version of the Frenet frame um, for higher dimensional uh, 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 curves, like curves embedded in Rn, where n is some big number. Um, you can obtain it by uh, generalizing the construction that we did in class using the Gram-Schmidt factorization on the first n derivatives of a curve parameterized by arc length. We're not going to worry about that in this class. And in fact, one of the challenges that I always hand off to our graduate students is I would love if there were an interesting application uh, that gave me an excuse to compute this in class. So if anybody has some creative reason why we might want to use the, gener the general uh, n-dimensional Frenet frame, which dates back hundreds of years, I would love to hear it. In any event, that concludes our discussion for today of continuous curves embedded in R2 and R3. In our next lecture, we're going to go through that whole story a second time, but talk about discrete curves that are composed of big sequences of line segments, as opposed to the smooth ones we talked about today. So, I'll see you next time. <laughs>